checking in? Um, almost. Uh, okay. Okay, I hope you're seeing a, a, a slide follow up, China. Everybody there? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, now you can go, Iko. Yeah, it's uh, it's ready to receive. Okay, so um, first quick follow-up. Uh, uh, China, I don't know if you uh, uh, remember this guy. He's the chairman of the Senate. Um, uh, select uh, uh, a committee on the uh, Chinese Communist Party, and it's the most bipartisan panel. Um, and <laughs> he he's retiring, and there's an interesting backstory. Uh, it was bi it was truly bipartisan. I was somewhat critical of him because he was saying some pretty inflammatory things uh, about uh, uh, China, um, but. Uh, recently, he demurred from uh, impeaching uh, uh, Mayorkas, which was was uh, interesting because it, it failed by one vote initially, um, and uh, his own uh, Republican Party surrounded him on the House floor and berated him uh, for not being the decisive, uh, vote. And, and then he went on the wall street journal and said, Hey, this is a dangerous precedent. Uh, and it's going to be used against Republican administrations. So if you think about that, that was pretty enlightened. So all of a sudden my thoughts about, uh, Gallagher started to, to, uh, change. Um, uh, but he had uh, talked about an existential uh, struggle, um, and uh, certainly some commentators were thinking he was uh, uh, escalating the the rhetoric, which China takes literally. You know, we we take everything with a grain of salt that's said in the political arena here, but China takes it a hundred percent. Uh, and then he started putting pressure on Apple, who was doing business with with China, um, and he he berated Disney for appeasing uh, Beijing's uh, uh, censors. And of course, he went after the Xinjiang uh, labor uh, and Nike, uh, and uh, he he. Uh, uh, chided Biden for going hat in hand and whitewashing Chinese aggression and thought we were headed down the path of surrender and compared it to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so those were that was pretty harsh rhetoric. But he's gone now, and he's gone because uh, he was trying to be uh, uh, bipartisan um, and and not following. Uh, the 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 Republican House lemmings over the cliff. Um, so, all right, shift gears. Uh, a follow up. Uh, Jim Teisel uh, sent a couple of things about the uh, uh, California. Uh, we are doing the history of California, and a very big part of that is. Uh, uh, as we've already seen, contemporary uh, uh, California is water. But when we go back and 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 uh, start doing uh, the, uh, the the California era of Americans, uh, we'll see that from the very beginning, uh, water was uh, a big a big thing, starting with the the placer mining during the gold rush. Um, uh, which polluted the uh, um, uh, bay uh, over the long term. But anyway, we had talked about the uh, uh, phenomenon of sudden lakes in the Central Valley, and then we only looked back and said, hey, those are the reconstitution of ancient lakes that existed before Americans got here and started uh, uh, draining it. Well, we we were wondering if those lakes were going to come back, but American uh, uh, ingenuity and water engineering has uh, uh, helped some of that water to recede. But 
uh, one article showed that uh, there's a lot of lingering uh, damage to, to farm farmland, particularly around uh, Corcoran. The, the, the soil is very uh, waterlogged still, even though the, the lake itself is uh, uh, going away. But then there was, uh, Jim uh, also sent us a kind of uh, uh, optimistic uh, article about what they're doing in the uh, Sacramento uh, Regional Water Bank. Um, and uh, they're approaching uh, groundwater uh, strategically. Um, and uh, uh, they think that they're on to doing something that, that's pretty uh, unique, is that they are uh, replenishing the, the groundwater table. Um, and then they, they started talking about the, uh, uh, the new climate conditions and how we just have to uh, change the, the basic uh, strategy and that it can be uh, cost effective if we uh, recharge the, the groundwater and use it like a reservoir. Um, and uh, uh, so they're saying that that can only go so far. You still got to use reservoir to complement the groundwater strategy. Um, and uh, Roseville is a, another example of, of uh, 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 water systems recharging uh, the aquifer. Um, so uh, we've got to change our, our strategy. Um, so Ukraine. Um, uh, this is this is uh, particularly for for uh, Carol and Barbara up at Tahoe. That, that Timothy Snyder at the very beginning predicted that uh, Mo Moscow's loss may not come on the battlefield. He he predicted quite early that it would be in other areas. Uh, uh, because on the battlefield, as, as we're seeing, uh, uh, Russia has the advantage of, of uh, uh, numbers. Um, but uh, uh, in the uh, larger areas, we've seen that the, uh, um, Ukraine has prevailed on the sea, the Black Sea. Um, we've gone over that in, in detail. And just today, Hungary removed its hold on Sweden uh, uh, joining NATO. So they're, uh, they're going to be joining Finland. And when you say Putin's winning the war, you got to remember that uh, he has now got a, uh, 800 more miles of border uh, with, with NATO than he uh, had before. So that that's not uh, that's not winning. Uh, Sweden uh, now uh, on the opposite side of uh, the Baltic Sea um, uh, 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 faces the the other uh, little enclave that uh, Russia has um, on the uh, Baltic Sea, Kaliningrad. Um, so. Uh, that is, and and they've also got uh, um, Sweden a, a, a short border um, uh, with with Russia there. So um, uh, Putin, and if you're looking in the the big picture, is not winning. Um, and in the area of diplomacy, uh, Ukraine's soon going to have uh, a, uh, airplanes. Uh, uh, today, Czechoslovakia is, uh, mentioned they had found a mechanism to send an emergency supply, supply of shells, which thanks to our Congress, uh, Ukraine's running low on. And then Macron uh, made an interesting statement that he doesn't rule out sending French soldiers. So the rhetoric uh, uh, is, uh, and diplomacy is certainly uh, uh, going up. The other thing that uh, from our conversation uh, last week, there th there was a, a comment that led me to think uh, that maybe uh, we, we should just take a quick look at the economic strength of democracies versus autocracies. We're talking now about Russia and they're getting... Yeah, eight I, can, I can barely hear you. Can you speak up, please? How about others? I still can't. I still can't hear you. 
one hundred percent fine from this end for John. Okay, I, uh, good I for me too. The re well, I'll try to. Yeah, uh, I can hear you. I'm having trouble hearing you, but okay. I just got a text message from you. I, I don't know what it's uh, what it's about. Yeah, I, I didn't send a text. I was asked to call this number. No, I, it's not for me. I didn't send it. Um, so uh, uh, the economics. Well, I'll try to find it. It's, it's, it's uh, hang on a second. Who's calling? Who is this? Uh, uh, John, um, uh, can we address it? Five, later? five, four, nine, five, nine, zero, two. Not, not for me. Sorry, John. Let's talk about it later. Um, the economic strength of democracies. Uh, yeah, John Pysel. Okay, thanks, John. The economic strength of uh, autocracy uh, versus uh, democracies. Um, and I, I started with the, uh, the, the statement uh, that um, uh, we heard in the initial votes uh, in the United Nations on the Ukraine. Um, and that it uh, the the votes against Ukraine represented a majority of the population of of the. I am, but I'm not. I'm upstairs. Uh, uh, Jim, I wonder. So if, I, need can, to do? I wonder if you can take control of your brother there. Okay. Um, uh, you can mute him, John. Uh, okay, that's what okay. I'll I'll try to do. I'm not seeing how to do it. John that. needs to mood himself. Okay. I found it. Let's go on. I just muted him. I, I learned something today. How to mute people. That'll come in here. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the countries that uh, voted or abstained in the UN uh, on, on Ukraine represented the majority of the population of the globe. And I, I asked chat GPT, look out everybody, I've now got chat GPT4, uh, if that was true. And it is. it was true. They calculated for me uh, the most recent vote, 71.6% of the globe voted against Ukraine. So I said, well, that's interesting. And now we're hearing the argument that um, uh, uh, Russia economy is uh, succeeding to and, and this, over the sanctions. Uh, North Korea is uh, <laughs> supplying of all allies, North Korea. Uh, they're supplying Russia with uh, armaments. Um, uh, interesting that uh, China doesn't do that. Um, so that's on the upside. So well, what is the economic power that are li is lined up? Uh, the the, the uh, uh, the demagogues, the uh, autocracies, don't have 71% of the economic power. They may have 71% of the population. But um, let's weigh uh, the governments by economic power. And this is a, a, a nice visual. The world GNP uh, divided up. Um, and, and it's uh, hard to uh, uh, calculate democracies versus autocracies. But I throw this up quickly just so you can see United States um, and uh, European allies and Japan. Um, uh, you, you're starting to build up a lot of economic power. Sure, there's China um, at, at, at 16 percent. But there's a, a, and this is another way of uh, dividing uh, the same picture a little bit more organized. But my point here is Russia is 13th. <laughs> Russia is 13th. So it's China and 13th uh, position uh, uh, Russia um, that are uh, uh, who we're, we're up against. Uh, so forget the population of 71%. Um, uh, and uh, I found another analysis. Uh, I think this is from GPT. Um, 
uh, that showed uh, a little bit more uh, manageably the United States uh, far ahead. Uh, and then most of the rest of these uh, countries uh, are uh, democracies. Um, uh, here's China at 17 percent. Um, so what is the power, ec economic power of the uh, West? Um, and uh, uh, we're going to calculate that. I said, okay, well, that's uh, uh, the, the first uh, top uh, 10 to 11. What's the next 22? And democracies outnumber autocracies uh, four to one. Um, and so uh, what's the definition of democracy? Just uh, quick and dirty. They have elections that can remove people from power. <laughs> um, and uh, I didn't include as democracies, therefore, Turkey, where we saw all the shenanigans that Erdogan went through to keep his strongest candidate off, off the ballot. Uh, that's a, a familiar uh, tactic, unfortunately. Uh, but my point is, even you throw in all those uh, uh, other um, uh, uh, autocracies, uh, you you get a total uh, that just in the top ten of Western democracies uh, uh, totaling forty eight percent, and uh, basically the Western bloc is two and a half times greater than China uh, plus plus Russia. That's the main point I I wanted to make. So when we hear about the world aligned against. Uh, 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 Ukraine and the United States, just bear that in mind. The economic power of the Western Bloc is uh, at least two and a half times uh, stronger uh, than the, the uh, top uh, autocracies. Um, okay, the other uh, uh, thing I wanted to look at uh, was uh, in, in the light of what uh, Timothy Snyder said, um, uh, that the, the fall of Putin could very well come from inside Russia. Well, there was an interesting essay this uh, week uh, uh, that I read. Uh, this is from uh, this week's Economist. Um, and uh, Putin has been fighting not just Ukraine, but his own people. I mean, we've been so focused on the divisions in the West and our crazy Congress and what uh, what. Uh, uh, Trump is uh, uh, saying uh, that we're, we're taking the eye off of the, the, the similar weaknesses of, of the other party. And we don't know much about it um, because it's a closed uh, society. But the, the death of Navalny uh, uh, prompted this, this uh, essay. Um, and in it, they said, you know, Putin, his motivation is trying basically to cover up weakness that has been in play since 2007, and that he realized that um, uh, if there was any reform inside Russia, he would lose uh, a power. Um, but he was going to be unable to compete with the West without changing the political system, uh, which would put him even more at risk. So at that moment in 2007, that matches up with other events around that time, he decided his only way of holding on to power was just to spoil uh, the West's ability to get close to Russian borders, particularly uh, NATO. And what he feared most was uh, a Western system, democratic capitalism, coming next door to Ukraine. And so he, he set his sights on, on Ukraine. There was some funny business around uh, 2004, even with that election, when uh, uh, I think it was Yevtushenko was uh, poisoned. And who uh, who's the leading uh, 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 suspect in that case? Um, well, anyway, uh, uh, th they made the point that uh, Putin atta is attacking his own people, and there's no better example than Navalny. By the way, there's a fantastic movie. CNN made it uh, initially, 
and now it's gone into streaming on uh, Max. Um, uh, on uh, that Navalny himself made, and it it, it shows his uh, escapades, uh, and and he actually uh, uh, played pranks on uh, the, the the Soviet KGB who was trying to per, uh, persecute him. Uh, he, he's just a, a master uh, uh, entertainer, if you if you will. And watch watch this uh, 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 documentary he made by him. It's an auto documentary that that he, uh, along with his um, friends, uh, made exposing uh, uh, the weaknesses of uh, Russia. Uh, so see that. Um, so what else is is uh, uh, Putin uh, doing uh, uh, to attack his own people? He's increased the the number of treason cases that come before the courts. It's go it's gone up tenfold each time in the last two years. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, opponents just in 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 jail. He's even a, a, attacked the the lifestyle of uh, rich Russian socialites. That's how threatened he, he is by the influence of of the of the west russia's highest paid uh, pop star um uh was uh, punished for li living the high life and sent to, to entertain the the troops in occupied east uh, ukraine um so the culture war um it, it, he's uh, uh and this is what's endeared him to um autocrats like uh uh, in Hungary, Orban, um, he, he attacks the uh, 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 LGBT community. Um, he's restricted uh, abortion uh, severely. In the Soviet Union, uh, uh, abortion was totally open. Um, he, he's kept an eye on, on priests who might uh, preach uh, Christian values. Um, uh, he's uh, introduced patriotic uh, train, uh, military training to kids as young as four in their games. Uh, obviously, he's he's changed the the te textbooks about uh, World War II and who were our friends and who were our enemies. Um, uh, and uh, he's uh, eliminated Halloween and and Valentine's Day in favor of Chinese New Year, uh, which is just uh, uh, recently. And he's made it almost into a, a state holiday. This is Navalny and his uh, uh, wife, who is now uh, becoming uh, uh, the spokesman for uh, his movement. They have a daughter who went to Stanford, uh, for those uh, of us who went to Stanford. Um, so uh, uh, and then uh, an economic war, not against the West, but against his own people. Um, he has been nationalizing uh, private firms uh, at, at the slightest um, uh, insult. Um, and uh, I mean, he'd already done that with foreign a assets. There's uh, this, this book by a guy named uh, Browder who uh, uh, had uh, uh, a guy named Majinsky working for him in Russia, and uh, Majinsky was murdered in prison. So, uh, so if you, you've heard about the Magnitsky Act um, and uh, the past Congress um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, has sanctioned Russia, and uh, Putin is so mad that he's put uh, uh, Browder on the uh, Interpol list. I guess every country can put put suspects on the Interpol li uh, suspect list, and Browder's on it um, now at the Russian uh, in in initiative. And then we remember when we did the history of um, uh, Russia and the Soviet Union and, and the, the fall of uh, communism that in the 1990s state assets um, were, were uh, purchased for uh, 
uh, uh, uh, pennies by these uh, uh, oligarchs uh, who all of a sudden were in control of uh, uh, state infrastructure. Um, and they um, uh, uh, gobbled up all the money. When we were traveling in Russia in 2016, we were told that these oligarchs um, had uh, been under tight surveillance by Putin. And one thing he wanted them to do was to build churches to prove that they were uh, still uh, loyal uh, to Mother Russia. So I don't know how many churches that we went, went into had been built by oligarchs, and Putin himself built a, a, the brand new uh, cathedral in, in central uh, Moscow that, that we visited on the tour. Um, he's been at the, uh, the, the, the slightest provocation uh, confiscating private uh, property um, for any kind of political uh, shenanigans, even talking to international organizations, you can lose all your property. So that that's his war. And, and with the KGB, he has uh, tightly clamped down on public uh, protest. So you don't see much public protest in, anymore. Um, uh, we remember the, 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 the murder of uh, Navalny's partner, uh, uh, I think it was Navinsky, um, and that was 10 years ago. And ever since then, that kind of put the kibosh on public uh, uh, protest. Um, but with the death of Navalny, there were a lot of spontaneous um, uh, uh, commemorations and memorials to him, like, like this one. Um, and Navalny has kind of taken over the movement. The other thing to keep an eye on, I think we've mentioned this before, uh, is the anti-war movement within Russia called The Way Home, led by women, wives, sisters, and mothers of mobilized men. And they are uh, obviously uh, uh, protected by uh, public sentiment. So they can get away with a lot more protest than uh, garden variety um, uh, things. Um, and so uh, every weekend they turn out in, in white uh, when possible. Uh, they lay flowers uh, on uh, tombs of unknown soldiers. Uh, what can the police do about that? Um, and uh, uh, the, the argument in the article is made that the, uh, the willingness to make sacrifices for this uh, war is at its lowest within uh, Russia itself, and that the support for the war is slowly eroding. Now, this guy, I recognized his face almost immediately. He was on a Russian TV uh, when, when uh, we first saw the uh, Sunday show talk shows right after the invasion. And this guy was uh, uh, saying the same thing then, that invasion of Ukraine was a mistake, um, and, and it's something that can be corrected, uh, th uh, that it wasn't venal, but, uh, but he, he offered people criticism of the government uh, uh, without damning it and, and left out uh, hope. Well, he was allowed to announce his candidacy to oppose Putin in the election. But his uh, uh, poll numbers quickly vaulted to 10 percent, and he was swiftly taken off the ballot and, and, and barred. So uh, this guy... Um, uh, I won't even try to pronounce his name, but he was very reasonable on the Sunday talk shows that that, that were subtitled that you could watch. Um, we talked about Russian TV uh, uh, at the time and, and uh, how surprising it was that still some people could express themselves against the war. Um, this woman, I think, uh, uh, does a nice analysis and, and boils it down to an impossible trilemma that Putin is now facing. 
he he can fund the war, um, but can he maintain standard of living for uh, Russians? Can he keep inflation under control? And maybe he could do two of those, but to do all three of those things is quite quite a stretch. Interruption, maybe, John. Yeah. Isn't that pretty much the trifecta that George W. faced in Iraq, not funding the war while maintaining, you know, he funded it without directly funding it while maintaining economic growth in the United States. That was a great challenge for him. Yeah, I, and, and, and uh, other <laughs> times uh, too, LBJ in, in Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the guns or butter was the way it was uh, uh, proposed then. Um, yeah. So uh, 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 Putin's in a, in a similar bind. Um, and there's there's really uh, uh, no way out in that sense. The, the Western sh uh, sanctions are, are, are helping. They're not 100 uh, percent successful to the point of, of forcing uh immediate action but uh, this is going to be a, a battle over time um uh and the, the the tragedy and we've talked about uh tragedy uh in the past uh somebody went oh it's carol again okay um we've talked about uh, a tragedy and the tragedy for putin uh is the uh, he's just going to have to impose ever greater repression to keep a lid on uh and the 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 article compared it to the german high command at the uh, conclusion of uh world war ii they were in the same uh I mean, world war one they they were in the same trilemma and uh, they, they are their only conclusion is we have to go all or nothing and of course they they got nothing um but uh 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 uh, there's there's no way uh, out. Uh, Putin has to defeat the very sense of the individual will um, that that Mr. Navalny uh, embodied. But he's not going to stop because he has no way out. So that's kind of uh, sad. Um, the way home video, um, uh, the, the wives and the sisters, they don't just uh, walk on the streets and, 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 and white on the weekends. They made this uh, uh, video and they uh, found a soldier who was willing to say, uh, everybody wants to go home, uh, very much so. And so this this has always uh, been the hope that the soldier on the other side will throw down their weapons and walk away. That happened about a hundred years ago in Russia uh, when the um, uh, peasants uh, uh, just got tired of uh, uh, being uh, out outmaneuvered and outmanned by the the Germans and just threw down their weapons and walked home. And uh, uh, and then organized a, a revolution that which was the communist revolution. Um, so, uh, uh, but this poor guy, uh, he was thrown in a punishment pit for uh, expressing this uh, sentiment. Uh, probably uh, in Luhans, probably not uh, uh, a pleasant experience. Just today. Just today, so, so today is a big day. Uh, Hungary released Sweden to join NATO. And just today, this Nobel Peace Prize winner, who is a, um, uh, a Russian uh, uh, a filmmaker, um, was uh, uh, sentenced to jail for repeatedly criticizing the, the armed forces. He's already got his peace prize. Um, uh, so uh, he keeps talking uh, about the absurdity and, and, and tyranny of the process he just uh, went through. And it's interesting that the Western reporters are uh, allowed to hear him speak, at least up to the minute they haven't shut down everybody, but they're sending them off to, to prison, which isn't a good place to go. 
Um, and he's a, a member of the oldest human rights group in uh, Russia called Memorial. And they were actually the ones that uh, received the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So um, uh, that uh, uh, finishes my uh, summary of uh, an update um, in uh, Ukraine. Um, and does anybody have anything to add uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, update? Hearing uh, none, seeing no hands raised, um, we'll go on to the next, which was, uh, uh, I've always uh, liked the idea that this would be uh, more interactive. And we had a very interesting interaction last week that left me kind of puzzled uh, because um, uh, Homer mentioned uh, the book on the left, which was uh, written in 1981, the nine nations of uh, North America. But Ramsey had introduced this to a book that was written um, 12 years ago uh, called American uh, Nations, similar title, but there were 11 of those. And you can see here real sketchy uh, maps of what those nations were. So I uh, expanded on that and uh, uh, recreated these more uh, uh, visual uh, maps for uh, people like uh, David Pepper. Um, and uh, these are, here's the, the, the nine nations um, that uh, uh, were, were written about in 1981 by uh, Garo. Uh, and here are the nine. Homer has studied them and found that uh, the one similarity uh, they have is that they both break somewhere around the uh, Hatchapi Pass, uh, the grapevine, um, between uh, the uh, left wing uh, of uh, uh, the left coast uh, in uh, uh, Woodard's uh, parlance uh, and uh, uh, El Norte, uh, the, the uh, uh, Latino uh, influence. Um, I think, uh, uh, and, and maybe Homer can talk more about Garo, but I, I remember the oldest is really El Norte. Uh, you can see a, a tongue of El Norte going up into um, uh, all the way into Colorado. And Santa Fe uh, uh, was arguably, and we've had this debate uh, before, but certainly it was the first capital city. There may have been uh, uh, some cities in, in Florida that were a decade uh, older, um, uh, but, but uh, we uh, looked this up and it certainly, Santa Fe was the first capital um, in, in the United uh, States. Uh, um, and so um, this, the second oldest is uh, New France, which uh, Homer is very proud of. You can see he would have liked this other book, which shows the French um, uh, part uh, to, to extend uh, more north, Quebec, uh, and to comprise a larger uh, uh, land area. Um, also among the oldest is, is Tidewater. Um, uh, a latecomer is uh, uh, Dutch in uh, New Netherlands. Yankeedom, of course, is the Pilgrims. Um, uh, and that extends um, uh, uh, across the uh, Northern Belt. Um, and then there, there was the Midlands, something in between uh, where Ramsey uh, and and his, his uh, uh, folks would be, although Tidewater, I, I think he's right on the border of uh, Midlands and Tidewater. Um, and uh, for for me, being from Indiana, um, uh, northern Indiana uh, was, was Midlands, but southern Indiana is Greater Appalachia, where you you get the 
uh, uh, late arrival, the relatively late arrival of, of the Irish, uh, um, uh, Scots-Irish. Um, and all along, there's there's the uh, the Deep South, uh, also a, a very old part, um, the, that had been started by the um, the the second sons of England who uh, went to the Bahamas uh, and started plantations instead of staying in England because their older bro uh, brothers got to r uh, run the estates. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, when they ran out of uh, 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 resources or produced too many extra sons, uh, then they went to the Deep South. So they very much had the uh, slave uh, 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 culture, uh, 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 economy uh, of, of the Caribbean. Um, so that that's kind of my 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 quick uh, uh, whirlwind off the off the top of my head. Homer, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything more about your book and in, in major other major way that uh, there's a difference. Well, um, more not really different from what you said. It's just that the what's interesting about the books is how they make the case that these differences and origins are still very obviously manifest in differences today between these regions of the country, the cultures of these different nations. And Garreau, I don't, I don't know if I've read Woodward's book. Uh, he wasn't sure that this agglomeration of the United States and North America was going to survive because he thinks the differences are pretty profound. I'm, I'm glad we're in what he called ecotopia, the green bit on the left. Um, and I have to credit the later book for recognizing the, the importance of Greater Appalachia, which has been emphasized by two recent books. Of course, you know, The Hillbilly and Elegy, and then um, Barbara Kingsolver's book, Demon Copperhead. And its main point is how different Appalachia is and how oppressed it is by coal industries and now by pharmaceutical companies, makers of fentanyl. Uh, how hopeless uh, they are. Uh, it, it's, it's insightful to not think of us as one people, but as many different people traced diff to different origins and different great geographic parts of North America. And what how the differences affect politics as it's played out now. Well, uh, uh, well said, Homer. Well, well said. By the way, uh, I, I'm taking your advice and uh, uh, reading the last couple of chapters of uh, Demon uh, uh, Copperfield uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and enjoy. I read I had read the uh, confided to Homer. I'd read the, the first half and kind of ran out of gas, but I, I am going to uh, finish it. Um, so thank you for that, Homer. It's a pretty depressing book until near the end, you yeah. know. It is. It is. That's why I I, I, I laid he, off. Yeah, I, yeah. The second to the last chapter, he come he comes home, and I'm beginning to see where it's going. So Ramsey, I I kind of asked him about this uh, difference because he was responsible for. Uh, introducing our, our study, uh, well, our, uh, his monthly uh, history group to um, the Woodard book. Um, uh, but his answer was uh, uh, that he was off hiking in Ectopia today. <laughs> Ecoto Ecotopia. <laughs> Eco Eco oh, yeah. Uh, Ecotopia today, uh, i.e. Point Race. So uh, uh, he had an event uh, scheduled there. So uh, he wasn't uh, 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 going to be able to pull himself away from uh, uh, the far end of the left uh, uh, coast, uh, which he pointed out he was walking uh, on the edge of the continental plate. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, that's, that was his thing. And then Homer, I, I, I uh, uh, made... Uh, 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 what uh, uh, I quoted, uh, what he said, if he wasn't going to be here, Homer, your words were going to live on. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, and so 
because Homer wasn't, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ramsey wasn't going to be here because I'd kind of asked him, How, could you contrast these two books? And he said, no, he wasn't going to be here. So um, I, I, I went to uh, my new friend, uh, chat uh, uh, GPT-4, and said, please uh, uh, compare and contrast these two books. And uh, Homer's kind of nailed it, but I'll go through what, what, what uh, artificial intelligence had to say. Uh, first of all, they were both in influential, but they used different uh, methodology. And they uh, uh, emphasized the, the common ground. Uh, they each looked at this distinct regions uh, with their own unique cultural and historical roots and uh, looked at the influence on uh, politics and, and, and society and kind of concluded they actually uh, affected uh, everything. Uh, but the difference were, uh, was the, uh, Homer, uh, they emphasized Guru, uh, Guru's uh, analysis is, is more uh, grounded in economics uh, and cultural practice contemporary to the 1980s, whereas uh, Woodard's uh, more recent book uh, it, uh, it looks at the uh, historical migrations and settlement patterns over a couple of centuries. Uh, so that was one difference. Uh, and then the, the methodological um, approach, uh, uh, Gros was more a contemporary economic, uh, more journalistic uh, based on travels and observations. Whereas uh, Woodward's uh, more recent uh, book used uh, settlement patterns over centuries and, and was even anthropological they uh, they use that word in in its uh scope um the purpose and implications um uh Garo's work was more uh, described as being more exploratory by chat gpt um and uh, uh practical uh, Woodward's is uh, looking at the historical roots, or it's looking at more uh, uh, deeply ingrained uh, divisions and the implications they have for uh, politics. Uh, Garo looked more at uh, uh, from the standpoint of cohesion, how uh, similarities might uh, bring people uh, together. Um, why as uh, 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 Woodard looked at differences, um, but uh, in the very ecumenical summary, uh, they were complementary to each other and, and together uh, uh, gave us a, a richer uh, understanding. Um, and so uh, uh, this just says pretty much the same thing. So that that's my uh, first big foray into uh, uh, chat uh, uh, GPT. Um, I'm sure I'll be annoying Ramsey uh, with future uh, uh, consultations with my new friend. Uh, uh, oh, I did one more thing. I said, well, thank you for that. Um, but has either book been misunderstood or abused in the context of political agreement, sort of anticipating? And uh, uh, one said, well, the, the, the culture on regionalism is kind of uh, fraught um, and, and that Woodard's framework uh, has been oversimplified uh, and in fact could be used to support secession. <laughs> and I think that the, the topic of uh, uh, California seceding, the left coast seceding, has come up in our discussions uh, before. Uh, the other uh, 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 problem is Garo's, uh, because it, it looks uh, at uh, more closely at economic factors, might favor certain regions because of their economic favorability, and but that both are uh, vulnerable to reductionist uh, sound bites. Um, okay, uh, John, and on, on on that note. You were talking about the scale of the economy of Russia. Isn't California alone like the sixth largest economy in the world? 
I think that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, just, you know, that's just California. Like, yeah. Most, so it's, it, it is, it'd be really interesting to look at like the money um, in the country and where a lot of it's produced. Because I think a, a large percent is the West Coast and the East Coast. You know, the food, middle, middle America, you know, grain, oh, but, but yeah, just interesting from a GDP point of view. Yeah, yeah, and and I I remember um, when the analysis of uh, the the election uh, of Hillary versus Trump, they came out with the counties that voted for Trump and the counties that voted for Hillary, and the counties that voted for Hillary were much more economically uh, productive. Um, uh, you know, if you think about it, that's not too much of a of a surprise. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, California is a, a a major player, and I think if you, uh, we I need to go back to that one uh, chart, but I think uh, they would slot in uh, uh, number three. I think they're ahead of Britain now. So anyway, Ico. Yeah. The, the whole thing makes me a little bit uncomfortable because you're moving away from one man, one vote to who has the biggest wallet. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, if you, uh, in speak of individual states, economies, I understand that New Jersey, if it were a separate country, would rank slightly ahead of Russia. <laughs> oh, that, uh, what did he say? It's almost as pleasant. Uh, and Rudy, Rudy says, and it's almost as pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, but Sonia is actually there. Uh, so I, I hope it's a nice day in New Jersey, Sonia. Medium. All right. I, should, okay. I just will comment that, in fact, uh, Everybody got it right with California, just one notch off. They were fifth largest in July last year. But, you know, with the rise of the profitability of NVIDIA, I wouldn't be surprised if they're now fourth. A single <laughs> company can have that impact, perhaps not on California, but in the case of Denmark, it's reckoned that Novo Nordisk, with its diabetes and fat reduction um, pharmaceuticals, is now contributing about half the growth of that entire country. Wow. Uh, Denmark. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Has anybody, uh, invested in NVIDIA? <laughs> oh, you're asking if I've invested? Yeah, sure. 20 years ago when it was 25 cents a share. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. He is kidding. <laughs> Sister asked me if she should put money in. I said, no, not now. It's too late. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, one more comment, John. Uh, well, maybe it won't be my last comment, but when the Chinese are upset by us using terms like and, and regarding them as an existential threat, they're, that's because they're understanding our language as, as, as it was intended. Most people, I wish they would say threat to our existence rather than existential threat, because that latter phrase is dismissed as something having to do with a obscure philosophical movement in post-World War II France. Jean-Paul Sartre and others were existentialists. So to use that adjective when what you mean is a threat to our existence is a misuse of it. Uh -huh. Okay, we 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 need we need the francophile input. The, so, uh, so my son liked to when I did this, would open his shirt and say "pedant or man," <laughs> close it up. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Anything else? All right, folks. Good to Thank see you. you. See you, see you next week, and uh, I think we'll uh, uh, finally be able to uh, finish the Middle East and uh, uh, get back to um, uh, Unipro Sarah uh, on the beach in San Francisco.
I'm in San, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> San Francisco will be discovered. Will be discovered while he's sitting on the beach, uh, and I'll, I'll go over that. So there you go. Uh, you're, you're counting on a quiet week, John, in the Middle East. I don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, living history, being at, uh, living through a turning point, is uh, 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 overstimulating. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It's like being back in the 60s, right, Homer? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We were younger than it could take it. <laughs> As Dylan said, uh, uh, I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. <laughs> and with that, I'll stop recording. Thank you, John. Okay, glad you could make it, Sonia. <laughs>